Hi, this is Richard and Craig with the week three feedback video. Mm. Craig, we've got about 12,000 learners now on the course. Mm. And there have been about 10,000 comments overall. Mm. That's a lot of work for uh, Jen and Sherelle. It sure <laughs> is. So an invitation for our learners to really sort of focus on the current week because that's, that's where our moderators, Jen and Sherelle, are going to be focusing yeah. their efforts. Mm, yeah. yeah. Lots coming up this week around multitasking. That's, that's of course, mm. one of the huge topics every time we run this. Yeah. Well, it's a big week around productivity and work and home and how we go about our life, our personal life. And multitasking is one of these modern myths. Um, based on a false assumption, we pay attention to multiple complex things at the same time. <clears throat> I mean, some learners were saying, well, why would you be at work and eating your lunch while you're doing emails and um, and uh, answering, you know, talking on the phone while you're, you're writing an email? Which is a good question, really. Well, why would you? But that's what a lot of people do these days or think yes. that they need to do or assume that that's associated with efficiency. It's often in job interviews and position descriptions and people's resumes, mm. right? Good yeah. multitasking abilities. Yeah. And you should say, no, I'm sorry, the human brain doesn't multitask, but I'm very good at efficient attention switching <laughs> or task switching because <laughs> that's uh, much better. Um, but there were some questions, uh, for example, about, well, if you become too efficient and, um, and focused, then does that lead to burnout? Well, what we know from the research that's coming out shows that mindfulness reduces burnout. And, um, but when we're working in a more mindful way, where less is more sometimes. We don't have the nervous tension and energy that's often running in the background. And we use less energy, but it's focused in a much better way. Yes. So we use less energy, mental and physical, uh, to get the same or oftentimes more work done. Yeah. Concentration and mindfulness are actually different things. I mean, they're, mm. there's a lot of overlap between them, but they're different parts of the brain that are active mm. when we're doing those things. And I think sometimes people conflate concentration with mindfulness. Mindfulness is really more that sort of open monitoring of being aware of, in mm. the present, but aware of what's happening in the body and the mind and around us from moment to moment. And I think we could definitely concentrate too hard sometimes. Well, yeah, if we're, if we're turning concentration into hard work, then we're often struggling with distractions and trying to block things out, which we know doesn't work. That's right. Rather than from a mindfulness perspective, not having to be interested in things that are not relevant now yes um, and being able to let those things go so there's a kind of a letting go but an engagement at the same mm. time perhaps revisiting the training the puppy meditation mm. might be helpful too just cultivating mm. that sense of gently letting things go rather than trying to sort of yeah. force it mm. and it doesn't really lead to a kind of an overstimulation I mean if we thought that being mindful was trying to notice everything that's happening everywhere all of the time uh, then that could probably <laughs> yes. drive us around the bend. But if we just realise, well, you know, I only need to be resting my attention with this. Mm. Um, I've got a presentation in uh, 15 minutes and I've just parked my car and getting out of my car. Life doesn't need to be any more demanding than just walking from one place to another. No, and the word resting, I think, is important. Yeah. And, and really what we're doing here is cultivating a relaxed attentiveness, and that's, yeah. that's the important thing to practice. That's right. Yeah. Uh, uh, other related topics as well, like uh, music while driving. Yeah, and... learners notice lots of things once we start talking about multitasking, driving with music or podcasts, you know. Often a question comes up, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Mm -hmm. And I'll just say, look, it's a thing. <laughs> and and uh, I, th I think that the value of mindfulness is that we start to bring attention and awareness to our own experience. And so I actually often drive around listening to podcasts. I quite like it. But I know that I'm not fully listening. So if it's something that I really want to understand deeply or perhaps remember for later, I know that I'm going to have to probably sit down and listen to just the podcast mm. itself without driving at the same time. Mm. And likewise, you know, if it's raining or icy or something and I'm listening to music, I might turn it off and just focus on the road. Yes. And, so, and, and so it's just about noticing the effect of trying to do both things at once and perhaps making some better decisions. Yes. There were some interesting um, uh, studies published on um, studying. And uh, what, uh, for students, they actually took in most when they were studying in silence, contrary yes. to most students' yeah. beliefs. This was even students who were used to listening to music. Next best was uh, low arousal music. So just creating a relaxed ambient background mm. sound. Uh, next was um, uh, the ambient noise, road noise or whatever mm -hmm. else is happening in the environment. And uh, worst of all was high arousal music. Catchy Justin Bieber lyrics, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> 
I don't know. Yeah. Perhaps, yeah. perhaps. Because <laughs> if you're singing along in your head to the lyrics, you're not focused on your study. Yeah. I think that's probably the most important point. That's isn't right. It? Yeah. yeah. And tinnitus as well. It's something else that came up speaking about listening. Yeah. 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 Very interesting. Yeah. Well, and um, if what's um, known from the research, it's been around for a while, The what helps most, because there aren't effective medical treatments, but is firstly just learning not to be interested in it, learning not to listen to it. It might be there, constantly there, but you're just interested in something else. Mm. And the second thing is not being emotionally reactive to it when it's noticed. Yes. And, um, and really, that's bread and butter mindfulness. Yes, yeah. it is. Mm -hmm. And there are some interventions, even mindfulness-based cognitive therapy and, yes, and, and right. other associated interventions can really help with that. Yeah. Fidgeting. Oh, this, this often comes up. People ask me, you know, I, I fidget spinners or doodling, is that mindfulness? Is it unmindfulness? I think it's a very interesting question. Mm. And quite often I think that if people's minds do wander, just doing some simple sensory kind of activity like doodling or flicking. Tactile thing to engage. Yeah, clicking a pen or something. Very tactile, isn't it? That's what I, mm. Yeah. Um, just maybe keeps them a little bit present. Of course, you could train that with mindfulness just through mm. meditation. And of course... It it's not a complex thing, so it's not complex multitasking. It's something just simple and repetitive. Yes. And that may help. I uh, certainly wouldn't necessarily recommend it as a, a technique that everybody should adopt, but mm. um, some people might find that it helps. But uh, hopefully at, at the end of the day you could go beyond that. Yeah, mm. let that go. Yeah. yeah, and of course technology is a huge one as well, mm. and we probably don't have time to go into heaps of detail about it. Yeah. But just bringing some mindfulness to the use of technology to make sure that we're mm. using it rather than it using us. Yeah. And this sort of subtle distractor influence that it causes. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, so and th this is um, a, a bit of a challenge for many is, uh, and even just having the, the smartphone in iShot, for example, mm. is enough, even yeah. when it's not on, yeah. is enough to create a distraction. That's right. So yeah. that study you talk about, I think, where they left students who left the phone in the next room did much better overall than the ones that had it present, even in their pocket or on the desk. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And for the uh, constant checkers of their phone, if it was anywhere near them, the, the effect was massive on reducing performance. Yes. Mm. Procrastination's another big topic that comes uh, up. I'm not sure when I get onto that. We'll talk about it next week, yeah? Yeah. 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 No, no, perhaps we'd better give it a little bit of time today. Oh, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Uh, look, procrastination, it's, it's close to everybody's heart, really. But yeah. um, um, is it avoidance or indecision? Well, I think the best answer to that question is to have a look mm. and to see, is it clear in our minds, oh, I need to get on with this, and then the mind's finding something else to do instead. Yeah. Or is it like we're really not clear about whether we need to do this or this? Yes. So it's really to, to uh, you know, take a look and see what's actually causing the inability to engage with the task. And that's something that mindfulness lets us do really well, doesn't it? When we set aside judgments and labels and ideas of right and wrong and good and bad, we can just look very deeply at what's actually happening and start to notice that yeah. the habit of procrastination could be a whole range of things and we can really start right. to observe yeah. that and then and then of course change that habit. And when something procrastination versus the the need to take a break you know now it might be um, look uh, we're a student and we've got some study to get on with or there's a job that needs to be done and we've been having a break for three hours three hours on Facebook and gaming and uh, not, not exactly resting the mind but <laughs> cat videos yeah. and everything else and um, you know, it's not like it's not about the break. It's about finding anything else to do to avoid. Whereas, um, you know, when we do need to take a break, if we are mindful, we've been working and getting on with things. You've had a whole bunch of, of work to do, and you're noticing that the body, the mind, are fatiguing. You notice the attention. You know, is getting very blunt. To be mindful means to notice the state of the mind and the body. It does, yeah. and to respond to it, to give the mind and body a break you know, to do something else for a while, to just rest, uh, to get a little bit of fresh air. But that's not avoidance. That's not procrastination. That's just noticing and looking after your mind and body. And, yeah. um, and they, they, they feel two very different things. Yeah, very different. Also avoiding difficult emotions or difficult mm. experiences. Mm. A, yes. a lot of learners were saying they're starting to notice that's one of the reasons that they procrastinate. Yeah, and so very often just starting with a little bit of mindfulness and just learning to let those feelings be there, <clears throat> even if they're uncomfortable, just to soften the attitude to them. It can make it easier to sort of yeah. then just gently engage the attention. Sometimes doing anything really meaningful, like you know, studying or, or working to meet a deadline, it often does, there's some degree of discomfort, isn't there, with having yeah. to sit and focus for an extended period of time. And of course, if that's a meaningful thing to do, mm -hmm. 
we'd, we'd probably want to learn to sit with those th- yeah. th- those feelings. Yeah, so starting by stopping can be a very um, good, good, <laughs> yeah. a good way to, to yeah. engage. Um, lack of self-belief and a history and our yes. upbringing can often impact on us now. And again, just, you see, from a mindfulness perspective, we don't have to go back over that and why am I like that and I wish I wasn't like that, but, um, but just learning to be comfortable with that. Yeah. Um, but now, the thing about mindfulness is the, that what produces the change in, is action now, what hmm. we do now, what yes. we choose now. And of course, if we have fear or negativity about our beliefs and, and so on, and we keep on feeding that by avoiding, then that gets stronger. Whereas if that arises, yep, there it is, it's historical. But now, what am I going to choose? Am yes. I going to choose fear again? Or am I going to choose... An ability to be comfortable with the fear, but get on with it. And um, if we do that, then we might find that the fear is less and less um, yep. impactful. Yeah, indeed. And that's not easy stuff. Not easy. It's a, a lifetime of practice, that one, yeah. ongoing. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. <clears throat> creativity but, as well. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, creativity, it's, it's an interesting topic. Um, trying too hard. I don't know if you've ever tried so hard to remember something. Maybe just remembering a name. What's the person's name? And then later on when you relax, boom, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a paradox. And I think, I think sometimes we get stressed and the whole amygdala is firing off and the little area of our brain that's trying to remember something is just not getting the message. Yeah. Through. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because creativity obviously has something to do with that default mode of the mind wandering. Yeah. But I think if we, the research actually shows if we're too caught up in that, we're not doing creative thinking. We're just getting lost in projections and imagination. Mm. And so to engage the prefrontal cortex at the same time, which is, of course, what mindfulness mm. does, engaging our prefrontal cortex, means that we can have that mind wandering, but in a more skillful, conscious kind of way. Yeah. And that's, I think, often when we are at our creative best. Yeah. I often like to think of that as mind engaging yes. with a creative process, yep. which is different to mind wandering in a distracted kind of way. Yeah. Um, issue has come up, and it sometimes does, about um, you know artists, and I guess Van Gogh is the uh, classic example of the tortured artist. But it's interesting to note, so in fact, one um, notable biographer of his work has um, actually said when he was in the depths of despair, he was not productive. Hmm. It was when he came out of despair that were the big productive... That's when he did his best work. That's right. Yeah. And, he, and at those times, he was incredibly mindful. Yes. Incredibly present, vivid experiences, which yeah. he translated onto the canvas in an extraordinary way. Yeah. And going back to what we were saying a moment ago, I would imagine that when he was actually engaged in drawing and painting, he would have just been in the moment and not caught up in all of that misery and, and unhappiness. Mm. Yes. Perhaps that was a bit of a mindfulness practice for him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's been a lot of interesting discussion about the neuroscience, how technical yeah. um, should the discussion be, but it's, <laughs> it's yeah. technical and it's simple at the same time. Well, we've got one of our specialists, Neil Bailey, to talk about yeah. uh, the links between neuroscience and mindfulness. And, of course, there's huge amounts of research now around that. Mm. And I, th- I think to boil it down and simplify it, Neil was talking about two systems, mm. the, d- the default mode system where the mind's completely wandered off and we're caught up in self re- self-referential thinking and judgments and that kind of thing. And then a more mindful think, uh, mode of attention that, that includes the prefrontal cortex. Yeah. And it's just about engaging that, that, that prefrontal cortex so that we're not completely caught up in default mm. mode, mode all the time. I think that's really the, probably the most important thing to understand. Yeah, and there are very different areas of the brain that are active in those different modes. Very, yes. And, and the attention centres are almost like relay stations. Yes. You know, it's like a prerequisite for the other executive function circuits to actually be online yep. so there are two quite different things that's right the brain and in fact the brain almost switches instantaneously if the attention's off in worry and rumination oh whoops attention back to the breath for that's example, right yeah. or back on task when we're working or talking uh is those default circuits switch off in the moment yeah and uh, and somebody asked, or a few people asked actually like you know if you've got very strong habits of being judgmental or distracted can you can you resolve them with practice and, and for me, Craig, neuro, uh, neuroplasticity is one of the ho- most hopeful messages in all of psychology. Yeah. Or There's hope for us all. There's hope for us all that, you know, it, I guess it depends how strong the habit is and how much we're willing to practice. Mm-hmm. But research shows that we can, in any moment, start to change the brain. And so if we really practice and practice and practice, we can change even the strongest habits, I think. Yeah, so if we're gentle and patient with that practice, yes. it'll happen by itself. Yeah. Um, but it takes a little time. Things worry and they might take 
in my case, 57 years to wire in, but uh, it doesn't take 57 years to wire out, but it does take more than five minutes. Yeah, we're always practicing something. That's, yeah. that's a good thing to keep in for mind. For better or for worse. For better or for worse, yeah. And just about the cognitive practices have been an important topic and, and uh, some useful discussion about this quasi-acceptance, which is apathy or avoidance and so on, and real acceptance, which may it's just the attitude of being open to the fact of what is happening is happening yeah. internally or what's going on around us. So to feel comfortable with that, mm. but given we're comfortable with that, then what to do? Because yeah. acceptance doesn't mean ignoring. It might mean we accept how we feel, we accept the situation, and we accept uh, what it takes to, to respond to it, for example. Um, or letting go. Um, it is difficult to try to forget. If I could let go, I could just forget. I mean, we might remember that something happened, but letting go of the attachment to the the feelings around it, the reactions to it, the yes. thinking around it that often exacerbates it. So the letting go of the, the attachment to that um, doesn't mean to ignore the fact that something happened, certainly. Yeah. Mm. So uh, lots of good discussion uh, about all of those things. And, um, and just uh, briefly in, cl in closing, um, the meditation practice, um, 10 minutes with the body, breath and sound. Mm. Yeah, quite a popular practice. Mindful listening, of course, takes the yeah. attention out beyond the body and helps us cultivates a mindfulness of our external world, which for a lot of people is a really useful practice. Mm. And then we can apply that to listening mindfully to a podcast or music or having a conversation where yes. we actually listen to what the other person's saying. Yes. Also quite a good application of mindfulness. Very good sense to train. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I think that's it for this week. Yeah. And we'll see everybody next week for our final feedback video. Mm. Just a reminder as well that we have uh, our second course, which is starting in a few weeks. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So we'll see you all next week.